At the dawn of the 20th century, immigrants flocked to the shores of America. Fleeing the economic and political hardships that plagued a weary Europe, they came seeking better lives for themselves and their families. Even in the midst of a Great Depression, these newly arrived citizens embraced their adopted land. The promise of America, the idea that anyone, regardless of class or circumstance, could rise to prosperity through ingenuity and determination, was an ever-present beacon of hope for themselves and for their children. It was the next generation, bred with old world values, but born and educated as Americans, who would truly build upon the foundations of liberty and opportunity. And while many of the children of immigrants found success, a few exceeded all expectations, even to the point of adding new threads to the hardy fabric of American free enterprise. One of these is Albert J. Amatuzio. Al took a proven technology, synthetic lubrication, and applied it in an entirely unique way. And from this one revolutionary idea, a new company was born. Countless lives have been enriched, and an entire industry has been transformed. But Al Amatuzio's road has been a long and undulating climb. His path arcs from a hard scrabble immigrant neighborhood to the fringes of Earth's atmosphere. And finally, to the boardroom of a global manufacturing and distribution enterprise. He has faced hardship, skepticism, and crisis, and met every challenge with a trademark blend of dogged determination and tireless optimism. A lot of people would have been content with being a lieutenant colonel in the Minnesota Air National Guard and a pilot who competed with the best in, in all of the military, but he had a dream. And it is rare to find someone with a dream like that, fighting all the odds. He was being resisted by everybody and everything. And you don't tell Al you can't do it. You just don't tell him that. Al had tremendous faith in the fact that synthetic oil was eventually going to become a very big factor in the marketplace. And it's only because of Al and Matuzio that the industry has grown like it is. That's the American dream. You know, you start from scratch and you build up a company. I think it's amazing. Al Amatuzio's story is one of vision and resolve, challenge and patriotism, innovation, and in the end, realization of the dream that caused so many to seek new and distant shores. It was a rough and tumble neighborhood. And those families that grew up down there, they, they, they knew how to fight and play and uh, probably do a few things under the table and uh, uh, a little gambling, a little booze. And uh, uh, it had strong old country influences. They were sort of proud of it, actually. Definitely, there was a pride in your ethnic background, your ethnic heritage. And uh, that was one of the things that I think helped meld the community together. Uh, the people understood that somebody, the next house or two houses away, was a different ethnic group. And you learn to appreciate and if not uh, understand them totally, you knew that they came from a different background. And uh, the people learned to get along with each other. They would share and exchange vegetables out of their gardens, for example. They all knew the parents, the grandparents, the kids, and they kind of, you know, in some respect, maybe even looked out for each other. Far from Duluth, Minnesota's East End mansions and hillside thoroughfares, the Raleigh Street neighborhood developed along the muddy fringes of the city's industrial harbor. Here, during the early to mid-1900s, 
Poor Italian, Serbian, and Austrian families lived together in a safe and cooperative community that was in sharp contrast to the neighborhood's dangerous reputation. In fact, it was because of Raleigh Street's collective poverty that bedrock American values prevailed. I think the big word that describes it is the close-knit families that grew up in hardship and uh, became very, very close, had high as uh, very, very high expectations for their children. They worked around the steel plant, that worked uh, in the foundries down there, and uh, they weren't used to just things handed to them. They, they worked, and I think that carried through with a lot of those people down there. They were immigrants, and because the people of long standing in the community kind of looked down their nose at them, they got the menial jobs. But their offspring then progressed through the education system and uh, worked themselves into a better standard of living. In the early 1920s, one of the families living in the Raleigh Street neighborhood was headed by Albert and Margaret Amatuzio. The young couple shared a strong Italian heritage. Our mother and dad both migrated from Italy. My dad, uh, I'm, I'm told, arrived in Duluth when he was four years old, my mother when she was six years old. And they met uh, because they were neighbors. In May of 1924, Margaret Amatuzio gave birth to her fourth child and second son. From the moment he entered the world, it was clear that challenge would be part of this child's experience. He was born in a home there uh, with a midwife and a neighbor lady were there. Uh, when he was born, he came out and he wasn't breathing. And uh, the midwife worked on him and there was no life and worked on him and worked on him and gave up, thought he was not going to make it and he was... Uh, dead. And his neighbor lady, Mrs. Puglisi, said, you know, she wouldn't take that for an answer. And, and so she worked on him and put him in cold water and, and warm water and lifted him up and down and whatever. And uh, he said that her reward was that he wet all over the front of her. And when the doctor saw that, he thought, my goodness, this baby is alive. Like his father, the boy was named Albert. But rather than call him Junior, his family adopted an even more descriptive nickname. He was a, the, supposedly the, was going to be the last member of the family. And because he was, he was called Babe. He was Babe to me till I was about uh, 12 or 13. And then I started hearing him mentioned as Albert. And I'm thinking, who the heck is this Albert? Is that a member of the Amatuzio family that I wasn't even aware of? Um, his real given name is Albert, but he was always Babe. From the beginning, young Al was filled with seemingly inexhaustible energy and constantly sought to expand the boundaries that defined his world. He tells a story that my grandmother used to have to tie him to the sewing machine so that she would, could keep an eye on him, otherwise he would run off and never know what kind of trouble he would get into. He would, he was very mischievous. He took a tire and he rolled it all the way up the stairs to the top floor of where they lived. And he let it go. Kadunk, kadunk, kadunk. <laughs> Crash! And the neighbors would come and they'd say, Margaret, you know, your son, Albert. And he'd say, no, no, Mama, not me. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't me, Mom. Raleigh Street was the perfect anvil for forging a young boy's character. On the rough and tumble streets, Al developed a scrappy and resourceful persona but the camaraderie and family values that governed the close-knit neighborhood also cultivated loyalty and respect. It was a neighborhood where you had to learn to, in the education system, accept what the teachers, what the educators put forth to you and accept their discipline. Because if you didn't accept their discipline and it word got home that you didn't accept the discipline in the schools, you got the discipline at home. My mother was the one that made us respect uh, demanded respect of uh, that we respect our elders, that we respect everybody. And my, my dad would back my mother up completely. 
Al's father, Albert Sr., had a compact but formidable frame. Five foot nine, 190 pounds, with a 17 inch neck, 45 inch chest, and 30 inch waist. Once, while playfully wrestling a much larger co worker, he accidentally crushed six of the man's ribs. Throughout all of West Duluth, his strength was the stuff of legend. He had this brute strength, and this is something that uh, was born, I mean, it was in his genes. And people didn't mess with him because, I mean, he could take down two or three people at a time. He worked at the Inland Coal Dock as a foreman or assistant foreman. And when he would go to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, he would walk over the railroad tracks to get to work. And he knew the men that were working at the railroad tracks. And they would have these large rails to move. And they, would, they couldn't move these rails. And they would wait for him to come in the morning. And when he would walk, come down with his lunch pail, they would say, Al, would you help us move this rail? So he would tell the four or five of them to go to one end, he would get at the other end, and they would lift this rail up and move it to where they wanted. This was the strength he had. In spite of Albert Sr.'s imposing physical prowess and being the family breadwinner, there was never any doubt that the Amatuzio household was a matriarchy. Whether meeting out discipline to the children or setting the course for their collective future, the firm hand on the family tiller belonged to Margaret, also known as Marge. She was a very determined woman that uh, she was not only going to succeed, but her, her kids were going to. A strong person. Marge was very well read. She loved to read. She would read books. She would read all the time. God, she could, she could tell you presidents. She could name every one of them back from the first one all the way, and she says, you want me to do it forward or backward? She could tell you that. Just amazing woman. To the chagrin of his mother and father, local doctors and hospitals developed a regular familiarity with the spirited young Al. He seemed determined to do everything fast and to the limit, even if it meant a few broken bones. And so one day, when he suddenly stopped moving altogether, it could only mean that something was seriously wrong. He was um, at a movie and his brother Don, his older brother Don, was sitting in front of him and the movie was over with and Al, it was time to go and Al couldn't get up out of his seat and so his brother carried him home. They didn't know what was wrong with him and uh, so um, his mother called the doctor. And the doctor came over to the house as, as Al tells the story and um, he said, he's not going to make it. He's not going to make it. And she says, the heck, you know, and she got a hold of the cab driver that was out there, and they threw a cab driver, picked up Al, and threw in the, hot, in the cab, and, and, and Brent brought him out, to, got him to the hospital. And Al said he remembers the cab driver carrying him into the hospital and putting him on uh, the gurney that was there, and then he blacked out. Al had developed rheumatic fever, a potentially life-threatening illness. Months in the hospital followed. Luckily, the disease never affected his heart or kidneys. Nor did it dampen his indomitable spirit. By the time he reached adolescence, an innate entrepreneurial drive was already in full gear. In the beginning, however, it was an enthusiasm fueled by necessity. He always needed money, and uh, he would pull many angles to get his hands on a couple of coins. He was quite an entrepreneur from that point of view. Not that it was uh, in a malicious sense, but in a sense of uh, trying to uh, go out and have a good time and have some fun. Uh, he was really a, a, a very uh, fun-loving, young man who uh, uh, just loved being with people. As a budding capitalist, Al also recognized the potential in America's growing love affair with the automobile, a portent of his future. When he was a young boy, he says, he tells a story about watching the cars go over the Arrowhead Bridge. And he thought to himself, if I could only make a nickel, 
on each car that went by, I can be rich someday. In 1940, Al Sr. developed trouble swallowing. A visit to the Mayo Clinic revealed cancer of the esophagus. It was inoperable. By this time, the Amatuzio's eldest son, Donald, was enrolled in medical school, an ambition his parents insisted he continue to pursue. This meant that when his father finally succumbed to the disease, Al Jr. became the oldest male living at home. My dad really became the man of the house. Mm -hmm. He went and collected bottles for pennies for extra money. He did um, collected coal off the side of the railroad tracks to heat the home, and he took on a lot of responsibility at a young age. You know, that's, I think it, he may have lost a lot of his childhood, you know, which a lot of kids did, I think, back during the Depression. Under Margaret's able direction, the entire family rose to meet the challenge. Marge was a matriarch of, of that family. Al's father died when Al was 16, and she just rallied. I mean, that whole family, the whole family rallied, and they had some pretty hard times, and she was the one that kept everything together. She started uh, uh, a beer tavern, as a matter of fact, down in West Duluth uh, to support the family. Downstairs of the tavern, there was a bowling alley, and uh, a small pool hall. There were three pool tables down there. And myself and some of the younger kids in the neighborhood, we set pins. You had to set them in by hand, none of this automated stuff, and sit on the edge of the pit when the ball came smashing down and watch your legs so they wouldn't get hit. And uh, she would always say, dear, you be careful you don't get hit by a pin and you know, things like that. Okay, Margaret, okay, Margaret. <laughs> By parlaying her resources, Margaret eventually purchased the Gitchenagy Supper Club in nearby Superior, Wisconsin. Throughout each venture, Al worked side by side with his mother as she labored to keep the family afloat. At the Gitchenagy Club, I'm sure that he was very active in running the, the club with his mother. Uh, he was very uh, close to his mother. He was close to his mother until she died. He was, she was just uh, very, very close to him and he to her. Um, and I think you find a lot of very successful men uh, were brought up by their mothers. Their fathers died at an early age and whatever. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems like it is. Do you know that General Douglas MacArthur, his mother came and lived with him near West Point? Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a very, very dominating mother that was just into him and his idol and I think mothers have, can make a tremendous contribution. Margaret, for example, I think passed on her uh, traditions of hard work and honesty and a little bit of stubbornness, although I don't think anybody will say that uh, Babe Amatusha was stubborn. I say that with tongue in cheek. Our dad was an extremely uh, patriotic person. Uh, he's, he always felt that we owed this country everything. We were fortunate to be here. We're fortunate for what we have. Like so many sons of immigrant families, Al Amatuzio was eager to answer America's call during the Second World War. Al graduated from Duluth Denfeld Senior High School in 1942, only six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. His school yearbook listed his future ambition as oil engineer, but any aspirations other than military service were on hold. Prompted by a longtime fascination with flying, Al enlisted in the Naval Air Corps as a trainee pilot. But after months of study, the Navy decided they had enough pilots, and Al was released from the program. It was a bitter disappointment to a young man determined to serve his country. He was still eager to get back into service, and he and his friend Anthony Rico joined the Merchant Marine, which he thought would be more uh, uh, another way that he could serve his country. You know, those Merchant Marine ships were unarmed, and they were always watching out for torpedoes. In fact, more Merchant Marine ships were something that naval ships were. 
In fact, one in 26 mariners serving aboard merchant ships during the war died in the line of duty, a greater percentage than all the other U.S. services. By ferrying troops and supplies, Al and his fellow mariners made a vital and courageous contribution to the war effort, even as the scope of their sacrifice was suppressed to discourage the enemy. When the war ended, Al attended to unfinished business. His brief stint as a naval aviator had ignited a passion and an ambition he was determined to fulfill. He resolved to earn his pilot's wings, this time with the Air Force. Back then, of course, flying was fairly new. This was a new thing. There was a mystique about it. There was a, pilots were, had a certain level of recognition and respect. I don't think he could have been satisfied with any sort of mundane, any sort of other job. He needed more. That was his mind, his mind, you know. And he's actually pretty modest about flying, um, but hearing it from other people, he had the right stuff. There are fighter pilots and there are pilots who fly fighters. Al was a fighter pilot. You had to have that, that instinct, that tenaciousness, that excellence, and he was uh, very meticulous, he was very aggressive, but he's a good pilot, and, and that's, that's what you measure a guy most by, and that can he fly, and Al could fly, and could he shoot, Al could shoot. He was a good pilot, took a great deal of pride in how he flew the airplane, just like he did in how he dressed and talked and uh, did everything. He just took a lot of pride in it. The life of an Air Force fighter pilot was tailor-made to mesh with his natural drive and confidence. Like his father, Al was not a large man, but he was living proof that stature is less a factor of size than it is appearance and attitude. I think one of the things that impressed me the most about Al, he was somewhat of a perfectionist. He was real picky about everything being just right. And the guys used to ride him a little bit. He was. He's ultra clean, his uniform was just sparkled all the time. He always seemed bigger than life because he carried himself well. His shoulders were back, his chest was out, he had a nice trim waist and his uniform always looked good. I mean, he walked in the room and his stature of size made no difference. He was as big as you wanted him to be. By 1949, the Air Force was transitioning from prop fighters to jet aircraft. Stationed at Selfridge Air Force Base near Detroit, Michigan, Al helped usher in the new technology by flying the F-80 Shooting Star, America's first operational jet fighter. He also piloted what was likely the first jet to touch down in his hometown of Duluth, where he made a memorable impression on the members of the local Air National Guard. And he's free flight the airplane, checked everything around. Then he went back to the tailpipe and rumpled up some newspapers, stuck them in the tailpipe. Took a lighter out, fired him up, nice little burning going on back there. He crawls in the cockpit, has the power unit start up, cranks up the engine, the engine starts, blows the newspapers out, he says, that's the way we start them. Well, that was just the showman in Al. He excelled as, as an aviator. He truly excelled. Uh, far beyond what most of his, if not all of, of his uh, other counterparts could do. There were very, very few people that could, that were comparable to him when he was in the cockpit of a plane. When he was flying, I think he yeah. was the, had the most joy in life. Yes, I do too. Yeah. Despite Al's love of flying and his great success as an Air Force pilot, his family came first. When his mother fell ill, Al returned home to help run the family business. He immediately joined Duluth's Air National Guard 179th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, where he flew the famous P-51 Mustang. He talks about that plane with great admiration. Its speed, its agility, and it required skill to fly. It had a large prop and a big motor and if you accelerate too fast, it would twist the plane. I was the guy that checked him out in a P-51. That's uh, 
uh, it's something he'll always remember, and uh, and he uh, he did an excellent job. And I remember telling him when he landed uh, that you've got to have flown this airplane before because uh, you flew it so well that you, you, all you all I can think of is that you flew it before. No, I never did. He said. Al's jet experience proved invaluable when the 179th replaced their Mustangs with F-94 Starfires. Al repeatedly proved his mastery with the sophisticated aircraft, even when confronted with a jet pilot's worst nightmare. On a mission over a remote part of Minnesota, Al's engine flamed out. His wingman was suddenly flying alongside a plane with no power, no instruments, and no radio. And so he's gliding, and I'm having a hard time staying with him. And so finally I, I got up uh, alongside of him, and I'm trying to talk to him. I don't know if he's hearing me. And I got on the radio, and I uh, got a hold of uh, Sage people, and they checked. And the closest field was uh, Bermidji. And the weather, he said, was 5,000 foot high overcast. And I said, well, we can, you know, we'll go over there and start circling down. And that's what we did. And the young airman got on the radio and said, I made a mistake. It's 500 feet. And so I tried to get a hold of Al. I signaled and I said, if you, if you can hear me, uh, you better jump. Get out of that thing. It's 500 feet. Uh, uh, nothing and we kept going all of a sudden uh, it got really thick and Al disappeared and I'm screaming at him to jump out and, and uh, oh my my heart was down in my belly and, and uh, I really felt bad and I started back and and I uh, was taking uh, directions from uh, the radar guy uh, and he says could you see a target below your right and I said no I'm in the weather and uh, I would pick up once in a while. No, no. Well, I got back to the field, and just as I was coming up, uh, I hear Albert on the radio, and he'd just gotten his radio back. Well, he'd got it relit again, uh, way low, and he didn't have many instruments. They hadn't come back up again, and he went on needle ball and airspeed and broke out at 500 feet, found the Highway 2 and was following it back <laughs> into Duluth. <laughs> And he came in, and I was never so happy to hear a voice in my life. Along with Al's cool head and superb flying skills, he was a natural leader who inspired the best in his fellow pilots. Eventually, Lieutenant Colonel Amatuzio, known as Ammo to his men, was promoted to squadron commander. He would bring lieutenants in, he'd listen to us, captains. He always had an um, open, open ear, open mind. Uh, so he got a lot of input and he trusted you. He's a pretty smart guy and he would be, he'd pay attention to a lot of detail, really good at looking at that and seeing it. And he could tell when somebody really knew their stuff and he would try to get that person in to the position where he could do the most good. Emma was a master at that. He gave people confidence in themselves. He gave people, rather than just running everything on the top of it, I was a guy that would give you a rope, you know, and then if the rope can come tight. He leads some people most of the time. Some people he got a kick in the rump once in a while. And if that was necessary, why well, Al could do that. But overall, he, it wasn't necessary for Al because he could work with people. He worked very well with people. He understood people. He had an innate ability. In 1955, Al married Carol Carl, an active, spirited woman whose personality mirrored many of Al's own traits. Eventually, their marriage would produce four children, Lori, Lynn, Daniel, and Alan. By this time, Al was flying full-time with the Air Guard, and growing up as part of a military family had unique challenges. He was at the base a lot. You know, they were on what's called alert and he had to stay overnight there. And you pulled your alerts, you know, so many every month. I mean, it just seemed like, and being little kids, and we were to bed early, you know, I, I didn't, I, I always wanted to see more of him. Because when he did come home, you know, the first thing we all did was jump on him and 
He gave us horsey rides till I'm sure his knees were raw. <laughs> Sometimes it was a little scary when he arrived because it was, you wait till your father gets Well, that's when we got a little older. <laughs> then we didn't want him to come home. <laughs> he refers to himself as a stern commander. Of course, we have to set the stage. We have a military lieutenant colonel, Catholic, Italian, raised in Raleigh Street. He had uh, expectations. And as long as you, you worked within the guidelines, there was always a, lots of love and, and respect. Um, downward, too. I mean, he, I would always show respect to me as his, as his son, as, as his boy. Uh, and, and, and hopefully, you know, I mean, I would earn that respect. As part of his old world upbringing, the concept of respect for oneself as well as for others had been ingrained in Al. To him, self-respect encompassed everything from behavior to personal appearance, and his fighter squadron reflected this. Al ran a tight ship, very tight ship, from the perspective of a captain or lieutenant working for him. Uh, before we'd go on a cross country, take an airplane and go around the country, uh, he'd land at different bases and. Uh, he always wanted to make sure that if you were one from Duluth, from the Duluth Guard, you looked good. We had the best looking bunch of fighter pilots in the country, I believe, and they were all emulating Al, and he insisted on that. We had the sharpest looking squadron anywhere. Our uniforms had to be crisp, our shoes, shiny shoes. He made us wear these damn yellow baseball caps, and when you started doing pre-flights under F-102, they got dirty. And if he found fingerprints on the bill of your cap or something, he'd chew your butt. In spite of his self-characterization as a stern commander, Al was never short on panache or good humor. This was apparent every time he lowered his landing gear. Uh, the crew chiefs uh, painted white walls on the, the squadron commander has his own airplane with four stripes on it. And, uh, or three or four, I can't remember. And uh, they painted white wall tires on it, on his, with, you know, the old rubber white wall paint they used to have. And he used to just take the biggest pride in that. He'd go off and he'd go across country and then he'd come back and he'd tell me, he says, boy, he said, the tower, they seen that airplane coming in and want to know where I got the white sidewalls. I found it very motivational to be around a commander that had all this color, talked a lot, Put a little bit of humor in things. I know he w when he was briefing us, for example, uh, the Air Defense Command had a checklist you had to follow somewhat for briefing. And one of the items on it was uh, that you had to cover is what you do when you get lost. And you just say, when you get lost, go right home. <laughs> and then he'd laugh. But to lead men in the air, where life and death often hang in the balance, Charisma alone is not enough. Trust was the cement that formed an enduring bond between Al and his squadron. This was never more apparent than on the night pilot Felix Tomlinson, Al's wingman during the flameout incident, found himself descending into thick fog. And I made an approach and I got down to minimums and I didn't see a thing and I went around. And I called and said, I'm minimum fuel. I can't go anywhere. I'll try one more time. If we don't make it, we're going to have to get out of this thing. We're going to have to punch out. Al came on and he said, Fee, yeah, this is Al. He says, I'm going out on mobile. He says, I'll uh, go out and park right under you and uh, you come across. If we look good, we, if I see you and you're, uh, you look okay, you willing to uh, take my word? And I said, yeah. He said, okay. So I went around, got back on ILS GCA, and I'll tell you, that was one approach, that those crosshairs never moved. <laughs> they were right on a bubble the whole way. I never saw anything. I went through minimums, I got the, the blinker, and I, which was at 100 feet. I kept coming down to 50 feet, and all of a sudden the boy said, you're, you're dead on the middle. Cut the power. It was Albert. I cut the power. Hit the ground, I heard, fell it hit, you know, rounded out a little bit, and then I saw a, a runway marker and, and a center line light go by, and it's the first time. I was on the ground before I saw anything. I wouldn't do that with anybody else. 
I get a little choked up just thinking about it. But uh, also there was a lot of risk on his part. He was sitting right in the middle on the end of the runway. And he was taking care of me. Throughout the 1960s, Al and his family enjoyed an active lifestyle. It was the natural extension of the lively games and sports Al had played with enthusiasm while growing up on Raleigh Street. Even among the other fighter pilots, Al's competitive spirit was strong and often contagious. Whether it was in an inspection, whether it was in playing ping pong in the alert barn or, uh, or flying in the air, uh, he was good. Uh, he wanted to set a strong example, uh, and he didn't want to lose. He liked to be able to get in there and, and compete. And he was very good at it because he, he knew how to get the people with him. Uh, he would get you motivated and charged up and feeling the same as, as he did uh, in terms of what you were trying to accomplish. One application for the squadron's motivation was competing in flying and gunnery contests. In 1964, a team fielded by the 179th, now part of the 148th Fighter Group, won the Ricks Trophy, a prestigious competition based on scored intercepts. The commander of the 148th was Colonel Ralph Jerome. This is a letter from the Vice Chief of the United States Air Force, General J.P. McDonnell, and this is a letter to me talking about the 148th Fighter Group and the winning of the Ricks Trophy Race. But an important down here is, please convey to Major Albert J. Amatuzio and Captain John Arata my best wishes for continued success. I thought that was a great recognition for a great team that won the Ricks Trophy Race for the 148th Fighter Group. In 1970, piloting the F-102 fighter, Al set his group sights on an even more ambitious target, the William Tell Competition, also called the World Series of Weaponry. William Tell was an annual competition where the different squadrons, uh, not only in the, that uh, did this mission in the United States, but even over in Europe, everywhere, would compete. As one of only three F-102 Air National Guard units chosen to compete at William Tell, the 148th's arrival at the Florida venue was cause for celebration. Al made sure his team was focused on the real prize. When we got down to William Tell, uh, we did our arrival show and of course there's quite a bit of socializing that goes on down there prior to the meet and sometimes during and after. Um, except Al was, uh, his goal was to win. And uh, the Duluth unit didn't socialize. Uh, when everybody was at the club comparing war stories and practice missions, we were in his room with maps laid out on the floor with our controllers there and uh, planning on how to best execute the attacks. So we never got into the celebrating until it was all over with. Al's air crews, maintenance crews, and ground controllers demonstrated near-perfect teamwork intercepting and destroying the target drones. When the smoke finally settled, the 148th had swept the F-102 category. Their victory celebration was courtesy of Idaho's elite Air National Guard unit. Boise had entered a team in the William Tell, and we bet Boise $1,000 that we were going to win. We took that $1,000 check that these guys won and we had the biggest party up here at, at the hangars when we got home that you ever saw. I was a maintenance officer and uh, Al, he wasn't there too long before he began uh, spending time in my office reading uh, technical publications on lubrication synthetic oil. And he said, all the jets in the world use this oil. And I remember him saying that, say, I said, well, wouldn't it be good in cars? I think what got Al interested in synthetic lubricants is the knowledge that that, that, that jet airplane he was flying 
was surviving and able to survive because synthetic lubricants were used in that engine to cool it and lubricate it. He understood and knew that a normal mineral oil would not survive that environment. So I think what he did is said, hey, the environment in this jet engine is very, very severe, but then again, the environment within the gasoline engine is not a whole lot less severe. I think there's advantages for synthetic lubricants to be used in the automobile engine. Seeds of ambition sown years earlier, glimpsed in a young boy's contemplation of cars crossing a bridge, in the goal printed in a high school yearbook, and in lessons absorbed from an enterprising businesswoman, were about to bear fruit. After years of witnessing firsthand the advantages of synthetic lubricants in jet engines, Al Amatuzio's mind had fixed on a new goal. Why not in cars? And that's when he got the whole idea to go into business with synthetic oil, his uh, Amsoil company. And you know, at the time, people were poo-pooing it. When he first came out with the synthetic oil, they said, Al, uh, I think he's been at altitude too long without oxygen. There was an officer down in St. Paul that I knew quite well, who was an insurance man, who called uh, Amos oil moose milk. And he says, Ammo's going to go broke, monkey with his moose milk. In fact, Al's idea was based on established science. His concept was the application of a highly developed technology to a need as old as the internal combustion engine itself. People use lubricants in their automobiles to protect their engine from wear and to provide slipperiness, if you will. Uh, so the engine can turn freely and maximize fuel economy, so on and so forth. What you do is under dynamic loads, you build a thin film. It's a barrier. It's a barrier film. And as long as those metal surfaces are not rubbing against each other, you don't wear. But a film of conventional petroleum motor oil, also known as mineral oil, because the base fluid is refined from crude oil, is doomed to fail as the random molecules interact and break down. In contrast, the base fluid of a synthetic lubricant is engineered in a laboratory to have strong, uniform molecules. And that is the simple concept of synthetics. The base fluids have much stronger films than a petroleum. In addition, the chemical potpourri in mineral oil includes waxes, that cause the oil to thicken at low temperatures, even into a solid. Again, synthetic oils are chemically uniform. The advantages that the products have is they have extremely good fluidity at low temperatures. And that's something that a normal mineral oil just cannot achieve even with the heavy use of chemicals. So low temperature fluidity is the major advantage. High temperature thermal stability is the other advantage. When you can put together a fluid that is very stable, right, at, especially at high temperatures, it has the opportunity to last longer. You don't need the, the same intensive use of antioxidants. The acid number doesn't rise as rapidly, and you don't break down, you don't get the tars, sludge, and varnish. Therefore, it lasts longer. A synthetic motor oil would offer consumers a quantum leap in quality and performance. Benefits would include reduced friction and wear, particularly at extreme temperatures, and cost savings through longer engine life, better fuel economy, and fewer oil changes, a capability Al called extended drain interval. However, formidable obstacles remained, including how to formulate a synthetic oil for automobile engines and how to market it. By this time, Al was ready for a new challenge. He had established himself very well in the, in the, the military, and it was, he wanted to move on. There was something else calling him. And he began doing experiments with cold testing in the freezers. Um, he started studying chemistry books and learning about additives and started formulating products and experimenting on them with uh, some of the people that were in his flying group. And uh, he says, geez, will you put this oil in, in my 
in your car. I said, oh, God. You know, I thought, my first brand new car, do I really want to put this oil in there? And he said, I said, oh, well, you know, I'll try. And I said, what the heck? He's my squadron commander. What could I say? You know, so I, uh, I, uh, I put it in my 1966 Ford station wagon. And Jesus, you know, I'd run it and everything is fine. And he'd call me up. He says, get that crap out of there. I got some new stuff. By 1970, Al had formulated an oil and formed a company. He tried a series of names before finally settling on Amsoil. Al was still flying but nearly every other moment was consumed with getting his new product off the ground. When he first started actually making oil, he warehoused it in his garage, and he worked out of his basement, he had a little office in his basement, and his cars were parked out on the street. <laughs> he, he used his garage for oil. He would write his own literature, he would write his own bottles, he would do all of his own artwork and design. He was selling oil out of his trunk. Well, I think we were partially bankrupt at one time. He just put everything we had into the company and had gone his limit on borrowing. I mean, like um, A lot of people didn't believe in what he was doing. A lot of people refused to borrow him money. And, um, you know, he was almost living out of his station wagon, selling oil out of the back of the car, trying to make ends meet. That was a tough time. He struggled. He struggled. Al was struggling. Um, he was trying to sell his oil in the conventional manner, but the problem was is that it cost 10 times more than the oil that was available at the time, the mineral oil, and you just, you couldn't put it on a shelf because nobody would buy it. He was being resisted by everybody and everything. The auto industry didn't recognize, nobody recognized synthetic oils, the auto industry certainly didn't. They didn't recognize extended drain intervals. Uh, the major oil companies, that's the last thing that they wanted was a competitor with, with uh, synthetic oil. Trying to compete against the, the major oil companies, that can become a disaster. It had to be scary because he committed himself to that and, and, uh, and he wasn't in Houston and he wasn't uh, in any of the uh, so-called oil areas. He was in Duluth Superior. I mean, I didn't really know where Duluth was until the first time I flew in here. As the stresses and pressures mounted, fate dealt Al a cruel and unforeseen blow. In the middle of all of this, Al got very, very ill. I don't know that most people would know that, but he was very ill. He was, it, uh, he had something that could have killed him. And he called his brother Don, who was a doctor uh, in Minneapolis, and told him his symptoms. And his brother told him, will you come down and see me so I can do tests on you? Al went down there and he tested him. And it was uh, a thyroid condition. And maybe there were eight or 10 of us that were aware of, of these diseases of the thyroid gland in the Twin City area. And I was just fortunate enough to be exposed to it and make that diagnosis. Don took him through the process of healing again, and he's never had it since. But if it hadn't have been for his brother, he surely he would have died. No one else knew what it was. So that was one of those small miracles, I believe. With Amsoil proving to be such a hard road, this health scare might have been the final straw, especially for someone with such an enviable career to fall back on. But Al never moved his foot from the pedal. The illness was just another bump in the pavement and he was determined to find out where this road would take him. It was Al's optimism in the whole situation that was so important. And really that is a trait of Al that has been critical to his success. It's a, it's a drive from within. There's no other way to explain it. He had a vision he knew that this product was going to be successful. He had to market it. He had to develop it from, the, from scratch. He had to fight uh, all the odds, all the people who said that it wouldn't work. He was, he was really struggling. But every time you talk to him, he had a success story with his oil. He never, he never complained. He never, you know, it was, it was always positive, always upbeat, always, you know. Um, 
he really believed in that stuff and, and, uh, and he just, he, down deep, he knew it was going to fly, he just had to figure out a way of making it fly. Al was a pilot, not a businessman, had no formal business training whatsoever. He has a head full of common sense. And so he ran his business with common sense back then, just as he does today. Al's common sense told him that he needed to prove his oil in the toughest arena he could find. Al enlisted old friend Felix Tomlinson, now living in Southern California, the hotbed of racing development, to help promote his oil. Tomlinson got a sample into the hands of legendary race car builder Dan Gurney and ace mechanic John Miller. They took a Yamaha motorcycle out one weekend and put it in the motorcycle. And John had one and Dan had the other. And he said it, Gurney says, you can't believe it. He says, I just run away from him. It would made all the difference in the world. So. They said we stopped and I changed oil and we drained both of them and I put uh, Johnny's oil in my rig and, and put Am's oil in John's rig and took off and John went by me like a standstill. He says, I gotta try this stuff in the car. The lead driver for Gurney's team was racing legend Bobby Unser. For over a decade, Unser had dominated the grueling annual road race up Colorado's Pikes Peak. But Unser was having problems with the gears in his Pikes Peak car. The rear end kept failing after just a single day. In desperation, he contacted Al and begged him for some Amsoil. So he mailed me some, on the, put it on an airplane. In those days, it was an easy thing to do. And I put it in. And lo and behold, my rear end, to show you the difference, would not only last one day, it would last through all the practice session, which was three days, qualifying day, which you run further, and race day, and be good for next year. <laughs> now, that's the biggest gain I've ever made on a lubricant in my life. In California, Tomlinson continued working the racing circuit, where Al's new promotional materials were giving Amsoil's credibility another shot in the arm. I was just thrilled when we finally got a great uh, advertising program and a nice label, and I, th this was the, the first of the Amsoil labels. Here is uh, some of the first literature. We had some real legitimacy and some uh, nice product presentation. Uh, this was a driver that uh, we sponsored and, and uh, had the Amsoil stickers. And uh, here I am handing him uh, the check in my polyester leisure suit. Without a doubt, the biggest prize in racing was the Indianapolis 500 and Bobby Unser was one of Indy's shining stars. By now, Unser was a strong believer in Al's product and a close friend, but the big oil companies had a lock on his sponsorship. That didn't keep Unser from doing what was needed to win. So I'd carry the oil in and, and I'd just set it in the garage along on the floor so everybody would see it. If it be a five gallon can, it'd be a five gallon can. If it be in quartz, it'd be in quartz. It all say Valvoline on it, or whoever was doing it in those days, and inside would be Amsoil. Bobby Unter has won the Indianapolis 500. Al had finally managed to move the business out of his home. His new quarters were in Superior, Wisconsin, just across the St. Louis Bay from his old Raleigh Street neighborhood. What he started with was a little dinky building. Um, and he started blending oil over there. And he also had his first office was there. And it was inside the brick building. And it was, it was very, very austere. Really nothing, some old, uh, an old desk. I remember his first Addy machine. He said, look at this Addy machine. 
And I says, Al, I said, you know that those old Addy machines don't even subtract? He says, I don't want anything to subtract. Al's optimism never wavered. No matter how small, austere, or outdated, he counted each step forward as a success. This included his acquisition of a brutish vehicle he affectionately dubbed Big Red. Big Red is Al's first semi-truck that he would haul oil with. It's a Mack truck, and it has no air conditioning. It has no power steering. He refers to it as a man killer. This is a big truck with a big steering, no power steering. I mean, this th truck is not easy to drive. Turn, turn, turn. Can you imagine driving a semi without power steering? I mean, it's gotta be impossible. And I think to him, it's a symbol of his success and how, right. how he struggled. That, right. that truck was there from the beginning and it's still there and he, ha he holds it dear to his heart. To successfully market a motor oil, there are two sets of three letters that mean more than all the racing testimonials on earth. API is the acronym for the American Petroleum Institute. SAE stands for the Society of Automotive Engineers. These letters can only be applied to products officially certified through rigorous testing to have met or exceeded the performance standards of these official agencies. In 1972, Amsoil became the first 100% synthetic motor oil to earn these qualifications. When you build an engine oil, you must meet all the criteria that has been put out by the, the automobile, the Society of Automotive Engineers, okay, American Petroleum Institute. Your product has to meet all of the criteria. The happiest day for me was when Al spent the money, and he spent a lot of money to go down to San Antonio and get the SAE rating on AMSOIL. And that was, to me, was when it became really no longer a research project, but you had a product on the market and it was off and running. And yet, even with the legitimacy afforded by the official certifications, Al wasn't pulling any punches. His label trumpeted AMSOIL's extended drain interval, the recommendation for changing oil, as an astonishing one year or 25,000 miles. Al was placing AMSOIL far above the industry standards. He was proclaiming the highest quality motor oil on the market. I think that's one of the best things about Al Amatuzio. Al Amatuzio will not go into the marketplace with a product that is not the highest quality that he can possibly produce. One thing I can say about AMSOIL products with, with the greatest authority is that they are designed with the finest and the most recent technology that is available worldwide. Another watershed moment for Amsoil occurred in December 1972. It had nothing to do with AL or racing or industry certification. In fact, it happened during an unassuming and unrelated event, a family Christmas in Wichita, Kansas. My sister, lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and as families do, we get together at Christmas time. So my sister came from Minneapolis to Wichita, Kansas, to my parents' house. And when my sister arrived, she said they came out of Minneapolis just ahead of a storm, and it was 40 below zero. And I said, how do you ever start your car when it's 40 below zero? And my brother-in-law said, we found a new product that you can start your car in the winter time, and it's called Amsoil. Well, my husband, Mr. Green, was a mechanic, and his ears went like this, and he said, could you send me some information on that product? Early in the synthetic lubricant business, there was a high resistance to the use of that lubricant, those lubricants, primarily based on price. 
At that time, Al was still selling in a conventional way, trying to sell in a conventional way, lining up dealers, uh, but not direct sale dealers, uh, basically uh, uh, real retail stores. And he found that he'd, he'd grow in sales, he was doing a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of sales, but he wasn't getting where he needed to go. And the oil was sitting on the shelf and it wasn't selling readily. It was five or six times the price of regular petroleum oil at the time. But he knew that every time he got a hold of somebody and was able to tell them why they should use this six dollar cord oil, he was usually able to turn them into a customer. By the spring of 1973, Shirley Green's husband had test driven some AMS oil of his own and his enthusiasm about the impressive but largely unknown product piqued Shirley's interest. She was an enterprising woman with experience in a type of direct sales known as multi-level marketing, or MLM, a method of selling products person to person rather than on a store shelf. To her, Amsoil and MLM seemed like a match made in heaven. Shirley phoned up Al. And I asked him when I talked to him, how is it marketed? And he said, what do you have in mind? Which told me he didn't have a marketing plan. And I tried to explain multi-level marketing to Al Amatuzio over the phone. And if you've never done that, that was fun. Shirley's initiative and ability to think outside the box appealed to Al, and her ideas intrigued him. Al invited the Greens to meet with him in person to discuss the details of multi-level marketing. Originally, Al was selling product on the shelf, and he refers to it as growing dust. You can't tell a story. Multi-level marketing allows individuals to tell a story. And so I tried to explain to him when people don't have a lot of money to do national advertising and so forth, that friend telling friend and neighbor telling neighbor is a way to promote a product. He had talked over the years about mason shoes, that, that he liked to sell his oil like mason shoes were being sold, which is a direct sales approach. And this gal really uh, got his interest. He learned that this one-on-one -on -one sales where you explain the benefits of the product, it might take three, four, or five minutes to get it across, but an individual could sell this product, especially once they've used it and they strongly believe in it. As a born promoter, Al instinctively understood the potential of direct sales. He loved the concept of using grassroots enthusiasm to sell his products. The more they talked, the more Shirley convinced him that her way of doing business had real merit. And then I said something very profound. All the oil is paid for before it's ever shipped. And then he really lit, lit up, you know. But he didn't say yes or no that night. It was about three days later that he said, I've decided to go with your plan, go to work on it. Al was taking a big gamble, but so was Shirley Green. Creating a brand new MLM marketing plan for Amsoil would tax her resources, but she knew the venture was based on a highly credible quality product, and she admired the fortitude of Al Amatuzio. When I first met Al Amatuzio, I could see the determination that he had. He had already been through a lot to get his product to where it was and he hadn't given up, you know. He had everything mortgaged, I guess, except his kids, and that's what he told me. And he was determined that this was gonna fly. And I could see that in him. I also uh, thought about, you know, you don't get to be a lieutenant colonel without some kind of determination. And I thought, well, I'll chase his rainbow with him. Others worried that Al was chasing down the wrong road. Few people had ever heard of multi-level marketing, and those that had sometimes associated it with a few get-rich-quick companies that had abused the concept. As a result, MLM tended to have a tarnished reputation, or none at all. I remember one day I was at home on a Saturday mowing the lawn and I got a call from Al and this gal Shirley Green had come up to visit him from Kansas 
and they were hammering out a, a multi-level marketing plan. I didn't even know what multi-level was. I went over there and I thought this Shirley Green was out of her mind. I didn't think this was going to work at all. It just seemed like a scheme to me, but Albert saw. From their very first conversation, Al and Shirley had recognized honesty and integrity in one another. And the Amsoil marketing plan was a reflection of these values. Under the plan, an Amsoil dealer would have an opportunity to build a legitimate sales organization based on a quality product. Shirley also drew upon past experiences in order to craft the best plan possible. I had worked several multi-level businesses. Uh, I knew what I didn't like about all of them that I had worked. So the one I wrote for Al, I wrote all of that stuff out and just wrote in what I did like and what I thought would help dealers to grow. It wasn't the kind of, of uh, pyramid structure that most of the multi-level marketing companies did. This was truly multi-level because the harder you worked, the higher you grew. There was no such thing as the top of the pyramid where somebody sat there who did nothing. As long as he had your signature, you could never grow beyond him. That isn't the concept of Amsoil. Amsoil gives the person the ability to grow as far as he wants to. On July 7, 1973, Al flew to Kansas in an F-101 to host the very first Amsoil dealer meeting. The turnout was large and enthusiastic. Soon, Shirley and the other dealers would hit the road and begin selling the product. But even Al, the great optimist, was unprepared for what happened next. When they set up the multi-level part of it, and I, I put together some literature for a sales kit and all the rest of it, and they actually did it. They, uh, it just exploded. It just plain exploded. That was the, that was, that was the, the fuse was lit and it was going. It was no time at all and they were doing four million dollars worth of business and I mean they, they, they couldn't make the oil fast enough and literally couldn't make the oil fast enough. I was not geared up to take care of the explosion that we were causing because we were all over the place. From that point on I think all he could do is hold on to the reins uh, and, and try to cope with the growth. We would only let people have one or two cases because we had other people to see. And they would use it, they would embrace it, and they would turn around and tell the story to somebody else, and they would sell it. He was ex expanding his blending facilities. There's plants to build and production lines. We just kept promoting. Tanks to build, infrastructure. There was a lot of energy the people who were working for the company had a lot of energy. The Amso dealers had a lot of energy. And all this energy was, was it's very, very catchy. It's contagious. And we couldn't print enough literature for him. It was just like, it's crazy. With the dealers, he grew. He doubled the first year. He doubled the second year. I think he went through six years where he doubled sales. Boy, was I wrong. Unreal. With the company growing by leaps and bounds, Amsoil and Al Amatuzio were attracting a lot of attention. And not all of it was good. One of the significant matters was some litigation that we had with Pennzoil because Pennzoil didn't like the Amsoil name, which initially was spelled with a Z. He's had a number of logos over the years, and he teasingly blames me for costing a lot of money on one of them because I suggested putting the Z in his uh, logo when it was used to be called Amoil, A-M-M-O-I-L, and they said, why don't you put a Z in there to have a nice ring to it, Amsoil, or Pennzoil sued him. And uh, he battled them for quite some time and finally ended up changing it to Amsoil, um, and in the end found that he probably could have kept the Z if he had wanted to, but chose to remain where he was at. He had another long battle with uh, a company called Amway over the uh, design and look of the logo as well as the fact we we're multi-level marketing like Amway was. Uh, Amway took on Amsoil because of, of the similarity, the red, white, and blue colors, uh, the, the Amway versus Amsoil. This Amway litigation was 
was awfully, awfully important because in truth, Amway was really looking to put Amsoil out of business. I believe that that um, turned out to be the fact. They thought they were so big that they could take on a, a, a small little Amsoil ammo, the Tuzio. They made a mistake. Nobody was going to tell a man named Amatuzio that he'd copied the letters A-M from someone else. Nobody was going to tell a career military man that the colors red, white, and blue stood for one particular company. And nobody had exclusive rights to a particular way of doing business. Not in America. Al circled the wagons. Some pretty tense moments existed. Some pretty important meetings occurred. And uh, again, it was Al's optimism, Al's perseverance, Al's conviction that he was right. He has a tenacity when it comes to lawsuits. If he's right, he's gonna fight it till the end. He never starts a fight. But if somebody else starts a fight, bring it on, he's gonna finish it. When the case went to trial, all eyes were on Al Amatuzio as the prosecuting attorneys took their best shots. And of course, one of the questions that I can remember is when uh, the attorney asked Al on, on the uh, on dais there, well, why did you pick red, white, and blue? He says, because it's the color of the American flag. And that's why I chose red, white, and blue. So I, I looked and I listened to that the attorney couldn't say anything because they were complaining about the color. And, and as it subsequently happened, Al won his case. He won it hands down. Of course, that was a victory day. Al called all of the employees up to the upstairs break room. Um, he had beer, he had wine. This was a celebration and everybody was very happy. We could do that back then because we were a small company can't do that anymore because we've, we've grown so much and Al would love to do that. This is the way he was. Unfettered at last, Al could concentrate on growing Amsoil from a one product company into a whole new industry based on synthetic lubrication. As time went along, uh, I thought, well, this oil lasts so long, we're gonna have to have something else because it's a year before we can sell to those same people again. So he got the two-cycle oil. Um, he came out with gear loops, and then he came out with transmission fluids, and the natural progression through all of the lubricants that could be used in vehicles. And they were into, they were into all kinds of ancillary things tied into lubrication. Equipment, uh, uh, filters is another big thing for them. And they just continue to introduce things, uh, different oils, different containers. They're just driving forward so that the, the base the, the catalog of material that that rep can sell continually uh, grows. Over time, the original handful of independent Amsoil dealers has grown into a global network, numbering in the tens of thousands. Throughout their ranks, the same enthusiasm that Shirley Green and her husband felt when they first discovered Amsoil is palpable, as is the admiration for the man who started it all. To the Amsoil dealers, I was like a rock star. We, we have conventions and meetings where he gets up on stage and they focus on him, they pay attention to every word he says, they want to get autographs from him, they just want to have their picture taken with him, they want to be affiliated with him because he has that kind of charisma. Um, and they really appreciate what he's done, he's made this fantastic product, he's given them an opportunity to make money and create a business. And why are the dealers and direct jobbers successful? Because Al Amatuzio is as loyal to them as they are to him. He would rather stay a small company with, with um, the success he's already obtained than ever, ever turning his back, turn his back on, on the dealers. It is a staple of the business. It can, it is unwavering. We cannot change it, and we will not change it, because these are independent Amsoil dealers who have built their life on their Amsoil opportunity, who have spent their hard-earned money and have worked it themselves. They're volunteers. And we recognize that, and it's their hard work and contribution, along with ours, that has helped Amsoil grow to what it is today.
Throughout Al's quest to create and market a synthetic motor oil, he was a lone crusader, rowing against the currents of conventional thinking and industry inertia. He had a vision. He, you know, no one had gotten into this field before. He was a pioneer in uh, synthetic oil. The major oil companies, they, they didn't, they, they poo pooed it like it, the guy was, you know, out in left field somewhere. And what did they do? They say, they'll tell you, the biggest guys that they'll have, and I'm not going to rub salt into the wound and say who it is, but they say, yes, Amsoil is the best oil there is. So we must make an oil that's just as good. In 1974, two years after Amsoil received API approval, Mobil introduced its version of a synthetic motor oil. Big Oil had dipped its toe in Amsoil's pool. But where others saw competition, Al saw vindication. And everyone says, oh, Al, now what are you going to do? Mobile One's in there. That was the best thing that happened to me. It totally gave credibility to everything Al was saying because they were saying exactly the same thing that Al had been saying all along. I mean, word for word. Their first oil was a 25,000 mile L. They backed off of that because I think they were afraid it would affect sales. It had nothing to do with the capability of the oil. They just didn't, they didn't want to make an oil that lasted that long because they wouldn't sell as much. Mobile is, is recently trying, I guess, to catch up with Al, uh, with Amsoil. Uh, they've introduced now a, a synthetic lubricant that they say is good for 15,000 mile drains. Well, Al has used Amsoil. Uh, matter of fact, Lefty Ward, who was Al's research director for years, uh, never changed the oil in his Ford Taurus. Uh, Change the filter, yes, never change the oil. Eventually, the floodgates opened as automobile manufacturers began to design engines based on the performance benefits of synthetic lubricants. Well, as demand began to develop, competition began to develop, and people like Castrol jumped into the business, BP jumped into the business, Shell jumped into the business, even Penzo jumped into the business. But what have they done? They've all copied Amsoil, all of them. Every synthetic oil that you see is partially copied from Amsoil. And uh, I, 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 I challenge any of those other synthetic lubricants companies to come out here and, and compete on the same level as Al Amatuzio. Can't do it, can't do it. His technology is too good. He is too far entrenched in his business. And anybody who can survive more than 30 years in a business like this in synthetic lubricants and continually grow every year, believe me, that is a success story. Al's relentless pursuit of synthetic technology has firmly established Amsoil at the forefront of the lubrication industry. His story is testimony to the power of imagination, and it offers a glimpse inside the mind of a man with a rare gift. Al was a man of insight. He was someone you know, of the ages. You, you don't find too many people coming along like that at any one time. Not that he was some great scientist, but he had a dream. Many people, including me, were exposed to synthetics in the military and didn't have the foresight uh, for what they could be turned into in a commercial uh, market. Al did, and Al came with that idea and, and uh, he went into being an innovator. An innovator is distinguished, I think, from an inventor by reason of the innovator being the person who is taking something unique and he's doing something very practical with it. He's making it work in the marketplace. Now we flash forward to 40 some years, the major oil companies, they all have synthetic oil. Tell me a company that doesn't make synthetic anymore. Just show them to me. And it's, it's gone beyond that. A lot of the high performance cars, the BMWs, the Mercedes even, are now recommending only synthetic lubricants be used in their vehicle. And the reason is that they are taking advantage of the engineering properties of that fluid. And the biggest name that is well known throughout the industry and world is Amsoil. And, I, you know, you have to be a complete shooch, as they say in Italian, to, to not understand that Amazon is Amatusia. 
That's what made, part of what made the guy an icon. He changed the industry. In the end, the answer to what has made Al Amatuzio so successful is the man himself. Al is Al. He's never pretended to be anything more or allowed himself to be anything less. And so, despite his phenomenal success, he's also a regular guy with a strong devotion to his family, friends, and the country that gave a boy from Raleigh Street the opportunity to make the most of his God-given talents. I think there's a guy that has never forgotten his roots. He is who he is from his humble beginnings, and that is still who he is. His success has not changed him. I mean, he's always Al. He's, he's one of this band of brothers. I know what makes him tick a secret of his genius is his interest. He's just very interested and enthusiastic. And in his mind, I think he builds these virtual castles of what's going to happen and works things out. See, he, he sees things other people don't see. He never met anybody that is, is, is aware of opportunity and positive thinking as he is. And uh, he doesn't give up, and that's the fighting end of it, the flying end of it. I mean, if he makes up his mind he's going to do something, he will go to whatever lengths it takes to accomplish that. Say something that, that is hard to do, he wants to do it. Say something he can't do, you better watch out, because that's what he'll start doing. Al is a fighter. He's a tremendous fighter. And I don't mean in the sense that uh, you know, it has to do with fisticuffs. It's, it's his, his conceptual way of living life. He fights to, to give everyone the opportunity for a good life. He has always considered himself secondary to the primary goal. He is a great man. And his persistence is what has kept this company on the move.